if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. It's a shocking statement at the end of this letter. As we've gone through 1 Corinthians, chapter by chapter, we've been reading words that Paul dictated to a scribe. And the scribe wrote them all down, laboriously, in capital Greek letters, one after the other. But now, as in some of his other letters, Paul takes the pen from the scribe and adds his own handwriting so that people know it's from him. He confirms his love to them. We saw that last week and talked about that. He wishes grace upon them, that the grace of the Lord Jesus might be with them. But before he does so, a thought occurs to him. What if some of them don't love the Lord? What if some of these Corinthians have no love for God? What if some of them have no pleasure in Christ, no happiness in him? They're not pleased to call him Lord. They're not happy to live with him as their master, their boss, their king, their leader. What if they don't love him? Could it be, Paul thinks to himself, could it be some of these problems that we've seen in this church, could it that be because there are those in the church who don't love the Lord? Could that be the problem? Could that be behind some of the many issues that have come up? There was a question right back in the beginning of the letter of, of, of the church uniting. They were saying things like this, I follow Paul, well I follow Cephas, well I follow Apollos, and they divided into different groups within the same church. He's the one we should look to. He, no, he's the right leader for us. No, that's the one we should follow. They were factions. And Paul found this very troubling and very wrong because surely if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter who's speaking about him. As long as they're speaking truth, listen to Paul and benefit from him, listen to Apollos, listen to Cephas, it doesn't matter. They're all preaching Christ. What's the problem? Then again, this led in the early chapters to the whole question of wisdom. The Corinthians loved wisdom. The people who lived in that city enjoyed the debate of ideas and words and rhetoric and fine speeches. It was part of their culture. Well, they took this into the life of the church. And, and they said, well, we, we should have people who speak in church with wisdom. And certain people seem to have more of this wisdom than others. And Paul says to them, don't you know that Christ is our wisdom? Don't you realize that if Christ is your wisdom, then the rest of them out in the town are going to think you're stupid? Are you ready for that? He is true wisdom from God, but not the kind of wisdom that people will admire. Nobody will look up to you if Christ is your wisdom, but he is wisdom. Don't you love him, some of you, even a little bit? Paul is wondering now about these Corinthians. It seemed, and this becomes more clear in the second Corinthian letter, it seemed that some of the people really looked down on Paul because of his, his lifestyle. He, he didn't look like a successful man. If he was around today, he, he wouldn't be one of those pastors who drives an expensive car or wears an expensive suit. He, puts, he explains his lifestyle like this earlier in the letter. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. Couldn't even get enough to eat. We're poorly dressed. We're buffeted, we're homeless. Doesn't sound like a success story, does he, really? We labour working with our own hands. So this was Paul and his love for Christ and his commitment and enthusiasm for the cause of Christ that led him to live this way. But if some of the Corinthians didn't love the Lord at all, no wonder they found him hard to understand. Then again, there was that problem in the church, notorious problem, a blatant and obvious problem. A man was sleeping with his father's wife. And everybody in the church knew about it, and everybody thought it was fine. And Paul said, no, this is wrong. You've got to get together, you've got to meet as a church, and you've got to hand him over to Satan. You've got to tell him he can't be part of your church anymore. This is very wrong, and you're all accepting it. You've got to have what we call today church discipline. And those who love Christ would see, yes, this can't be part of Christ's church. This is Christ's church. 
and I love him. But if there were people who didn't love Christ at all, no wonder they found that hard to sort out. More generally, Paul mentions in a couple of places in this letter the whole question of sexual immorality, sex outside of marriage. He comes back to it again in 2 Corinthians. It was something that some of them thought was okay as part of the Christian life. And Paul says, no, when you love Jesus, you love him as Lord. You don't just love him as a friend or a helper or an advisor or someone who hears your prayers. That's all true. But he's also and primarily Lord. So you love him in his commands and teachings as well as the help he gives you. Do you all love him, he's saying to them. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Well, we go on through the letter. We find there's a place where there's um, some issue of people worshipping other gods as well as God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They worship the pagan gods. And that must have been tempting in Corinth because from what we know from the archaeology, the place was full of these, these temples, magnificent buildings, some of them, beautiful statues. And that was their, their culture in that city, to go to these temples. And Paul says to them, no, you belong to Christ. You were bought with a price. Christ died for you. Worship God as Father and Lord and ruler of all. Worship Jesus, his son. Do you love him at all? Paul's asking. Are there some of you who don't love him? <coughs> there was a whole question of people demanding their rights. I'm entitled to this. You're not giving me what you should give me. And Paul spends a whole chapter explaining that he did not demand his rights because of his commitment, again, to the cause of Christ. He loved Christ. He wanted to serve Christ. He wanted to work for Christ. He wanted to see people believe in Christ. So he did not stand on his rights. And he says to the Corinthians, be like me. Love the Lord Jesus the way I do. Commit to his cause like me. Don't be insisting on the things you're entitled to. And then as we've seen, there was a whole question of the, the work of the Holy Spirit. There was a lot of excitement about the Spirit in Corinth. There were miracles going on. Extraordinary things happening. People speaking in foreign languages. Some people could, some people couldn't. Spiritual gifts. And Paul has to remind them, the main thing about the Holy Spirit is he teaches you to say, Jesus is Lord. And if somebody says Jesus is cursed, whatever spiritual gifts or so-called gifts they may have, that is not the Holy Spirit. Even the Spirit teaches us to confess and to love Jesus Christ. And if any of you don't love Jesus, he says, let him be accursed. Then there was the whole question of the resurrection of the body in chapter 15. Christ is raised. Does that mean anything to you, Corinthians, he says to them? Some of them were scoffing at the idea of a future resurrection. What kind of body could we be raised with? It's ridiculous. No, Paul says, Christ is raised, he will rise. And if you love him, you will know this. But perhaps some of these Corinthians never really cared about Christ at all. This verse 22, our verse this morning has been described as a solemn curse on false Christianity. Paul is addressing this church and he's saying to them, some of you are not for real. Some of you have no warmth towards Christ, no concern for his people, no delight in his truth, no zeal for his cause, no love for Christ underneath it all. Now it's true, and you know this, that it's our faith in Christ that saves us. It's true that the person who puts their trust in Christ is saved and made a child of God. But faith in Christ and love for Christ are not so very different. One of the Bible verses in 1 Peter that we're looking at on Sunday evening says this. Though you've not seen him, Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. That's inexpressible and filled with glory. 
believing in him and, and loving him are not two completely different things. They will tend to go together. I start out trusting him, knowing that I've offended God, knowing that I need forgiveness. I trust him. I find peace with God. And love for him will grow. If the faith is real, love will grow. Again, loving Christ and obeying Christ are not two different things. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Because we love him as the Lord. So we love him and obey him. Not perfectly, not completely, not as thoroughly as we should. But love and obedience do go together. So this is a kind of an acid test then for reality. If Jesus Christ leaves your heart cold, you've got no devotion to him, no affection for him, you're not bothered, is your faith for real? Could you be a so-called member of the body of Christ but not really joined to the head, Christ himself? Could you be someone who serves Christ outwardly and does things for Christ, but you don't truly know him? Could you be like a a branch, not bearing fruit because you're not truly joined to the vine, which is Christ? Could you be someone who calls yourself his friend, but in the end he would say these terrible words, Depart from me. I never knew you. Well, Paul's writing to these Corinthians, and what I need to encourage you to do, each of you, is to examine yourself. Examine yourself. Test yourself. See, are you really in the faith? Ask. Simple question. Do I love Jesus Christ? Because if anyone has no love for the Lord, Paul says, let him be accursed. I'm sure as Paul wrote that statement, he had these Corinthians in mind, people who are part of a local church like we are here. But it is actually a very general statement. It's very broad, isn't it? Anyone, anyone, any kind of person, anybody, whoever. I suppose you'd have to exclude people who never heard about Jesus Christ at all. Sadly, there are millions in the world today who've never heard about Christ. And you should feel about them the way that you feel about the Ukrainian mothers and grandmothers and children in desperate need. You should feel that is a great deprivation and a lack that must be made up that people haven't heard about Christ in our world today. I don't think Paul is thinking about them. But that isn't our case here. None of us fall into that category. We've all heard about Jesus Christ. He says if anyone has heard about him and doesn't love him, let them be cursed. I wonder how many people then, young, old, male, female, University graduates, GCSE graduates, employed, unemployed, large private home, council home, large car, rely on the bus. I wonder how many people under that heading then there would be living around us here in this town even. Second most desirable place to live in the UK, according to the Hertfordshire paper. Number two on the list of the place that everyone wants to live, Hitchin. But the word of God says if people are living without loving Christ, they're living under God's curse, rejected, under his displeasure, his disfavor. We are shocked to think about that genocide that God ordered of the Canaanite nation. I'm sure it was deserved, but it was shocking to think that God would say, go and wipe out an entire people. How much worse to face the eternal Judgment of God. And this is everyone. Some people think, well, look, it, it's not fair to expect me to believe in Jesus because I've got, I've got questions, I've got things I, I don't understand, I've got things about the Christian faith that don't make sense, I don't agree with them, I, I believe in evolution, I, I don't believe that Jesus is the only way to God. 
But he says, if anyone, whatever your beliefs and questions and problems and intellectual doubts may be. Other people would say, look, you talk to me about loving Jesus, but Christians I know have treated me very badly. I could tell you about Christians, so-called Christians. I could tell you what they're like. I've had a very bad experience. Don't ask me to go to your church. Don't ask me to go to any church. Don't ask me to have anything to do with Jesus Christ. But that doesn't exempt you from what the Bible says. If anyone doesn't love Jesus, whoever they are. Or somebody would say, look, (laughs) you don't understand my family. If I love Jesus, then as far as my family are concerned, I might as well be dead. I might as well not go home today. If I tell them I love Jesus, I'm finished with them. That is tough. Most of us here, I guess, have never faced that kind of pressure. But he still calls on us, whoever we are, to love Jesus. Oh, somebody else says, look, you talk about this, but all you churches disagree. I go to one church and hear one thing. I go to another church and hear something else. This person says this, that person says that. It's always, who knows what's true in all this Christianity? Yes, but you're not called upon to love Christianity. You're called upon to love Jesus. There's only one of him. Many people, I suppose, would say, look, I never thought Jesus was that important. But think about what we're saying here. This is, if the Bible is true, God, the one and only Son of God, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, equal in power, in glory, in majesty with God himself. This is the God, the only God, the only true God who became a man. That's who we're talking about. And we're saying, well, why did this happen? Why would he do that? Why did he become a man? Well, he became a man. Let's see it in the words of God himself in the Bible. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Can you find that if you've got a Bible, or perhaps we can get it on the screen? Galatians 3, verse 13. This is fundamental. Paul already said this to the Corinthians. He already said this. We saw it in chapter 15. He said, I delivered to you as first importance. Christ died for our sins. And here in a different letter to a different church, he, he spells it out. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. This is why he became a man, the, the great eternal God, the Son of God. This is why he became one of us, so that he might die the way that he died, himself under the curse of God. The very curse that rests on those who want nothing to do with him. He bore it himself, he carried it himself. He himself, though completely undeserving and unworthy of it in any way, felt in himself the full extent of that curse of God, that eternal curse which condemns so many to hell and judgment. He endured it. Of his own choice and his own free will, without deserving any of it in any part, he bore the curse of the law, became a curse for us to redeem us. That scripture that's quoted at the end of the verse there, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. It comes from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy. And the idea was, if you put someone to death and hung them up as an example, on a wooden pole of some kind, you had to take them down. You couldn't leave them there overnight. That would be a disgraceful and a shameful thing. But this then is quoted and applied to the Lord Jesus as he hung on the cross, the wooden cross showing that he died indeed under the very curse of God. Matthew Henry puts it this way. He hung there, suspended, halfway between heaven and earth, as if rejected by both, cursed in his death, cursed for us. This is why we love him. This is why we love him. This is why we're so amazed and filled with wonder and surprise and delight when we think of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
This is where that love comes from. Because of what he went through for us. Think of him there. Think of what he lost when he died on the cross. He lost peace. He lost joy. He lost his safety. He lost his reputation. He lost the shelter of God that he lived with all his life. He lost the smile of God, which meant everything to him. Well, think of what he gained. Pain. An affliction. Pain in his body. Pain in his mind. Mental torment, anguish, confusion. Pain in his soul. Separation from God. Cursed. Think of what he gained. He gained the attack and the hostility and the judgment and condemnation of man as people gathered around him and mocked him and scoffed at him. He gained the attack of the devil, as he said, even before he died, this is your hour and the hour of darkness. He gained the attack and condemnation of wrath, even of God. This is why we love him. This is why those Corinthians, many of them, I'm sure, did love Jesus. This is why it was so serious if some of them did not love Jesus. So why don't people love him then? Inside or outside of church, what is the problem? Well, here it is, as far as I can understand it from the Bible, people don't love Jesus because they don't think they need to be forgiven. What he went through, it it doesn't seem to have much relevance to them. It doesn't feel like it's important to them. It doesn't feel like it's something they, they need. It doesn't feel like it's doing anything that would help them. I guess an element of pride comes in many people. Kind of a self-righteous, defensive attitude. I've done nothing wrong. I've never hurt anyone. Why would I need to be forgiven? The problems in my life, they all come from God. God isn't fair in the way he treats me. And so on and on. Paul says, listen, you've got it all the wrong way around. If you don't realize what's going on with the death of Christ, if you don't see that he died, if you haven't reached out to him by faith, if you can't say he died for me, if anyone has no love for the Lord, he will die under that same curse, and rightly so. That paragraph in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, helps us with this a little bit. I'm going to ask you to turn to it now in Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 36. The sinful woman forgiven, it says in this Bible, the heading. Luke 7, verse 36 onwards. And what we see here is that one of the Pharisees invited Jesus for dinner. And um, the setting then is that you have a, a table and you... You recline at this table. You're not sitting upright on a chair. You're, you're lying on a kind of a couch or a chaise longue, we'd say today. You've got your, your weight supported on, on your, your one hand, probably your left hand, and with your right hand you're helping yourself to the food and eating. And this Pharisee invited Jesus, but we find out as the, as the story goes on that he didn't exactly welcome him. He, he didn't really give him much of a greeting. Normally you'd, you'd have somebody bring you a bowl to wash your feet, they didn't have shoes like we do, I suppose, but none of that happened for the Lord Jesus. Um, if it's a friend, you, you greet him with a, with a kiss. You embrace him and, and kiss him on the cheek. The host didn't greet Jesus in that way. You might have a, a little oil to anoint your, your hair and make it shiny and, and, and look smart and so on, and nobody offered him any, any oil to anoint his head. He wasn't really greeted very well in this environment. But he was there and he reclined at the table. And I suppose this must have been a, in, a, in a courtyard or something because evidently people could come and go. Because this woman could come in at least, although uninvited, not one of the guests. She nevertheless was able to come in and be around the table where the Lord Jesus is reclining with the other guests. And her behaviour is evidently something of an embarrassment. It's all a little bit strange. She's brought with her this ointment in a flask, an alabaster flask. So this must be some precious stuff. It must be some expensive stuff she's got here. And as the Lord Jesus is here with his feet stretched out along the couch, she stands behind him and she's crying. Why is she crying like this? She's weeping and and the, the, the tears are falling on his feet. 
and she's loosed down her long hair and she's trying she's trying her his feet with her hair what what why what is this about it's quite unseemly it's not what you'd expect it's not how people should behave at a dinner party like this and as she anoints as she wipes the feet and kisses them she then pours onto them the oil that she'd bought so the upright man the host the upright man the righteous man as he thought himself anyway questions this he doesn't say anything but in himself he's questioning what's going on why is this happening and he knows what this woman is he knows her track record he knows the kind of things she's been into and he says to himself if jesus there was any kind of a man of god he'd know he'd know what's happening here he wouldn't let this happen he wouldn't want anything to do with her he'd send her away straight away he wouldn't tolerate this kind of thing for a moment so the lord jesus says let me tell you something as he knows what this simon is thinking let me tell you something he tells a parable of two debtors and it comes down to this point in verse 47 The sign that you're forgiven is your love. I can see that she's been forgiven much. Her sins are many. Nobody's doubting that. Nobody's questioning what she used to be, what she used to do. But she's been forgiven all of it. And I know she has because her love for me is great. Because she's shown this great love and these tears and this ointment, I know that she's been forgiven. Many sins forgiven. The sign is a great love for Jesus. Forgiven little, love little. Cold heart towards Jesus, little sense that you need him. Little sense of what he did for you at the cross. Little sense of forgiveness in your life. And some people have no love for him at all. Because they've never come to him to be forgiven. And the people at the table began to say, who is this who even forgives sins? What is he? How? Well, it's Jesus. Of course he's the one who forgives sins. Of course. We know this. We understand this. It was shocking and surprising to them. To us, we know why he died. We know that he forgives sins. But the question isn't whether you know and understand this. The question, have you come to him to be forgiven? If you have and you found forgiveness in the one who died under the curse of God, you will love him. You'll be like this woman. And the greater your sense of guilt and shame for the past and the way you've lived, the greater your love will be. The only one who doesn't love him is the one who's never been forgiven. I suppose, looking at verse 50, I suppose we could fill in this woman's story to some extent. She must then have, have perhaps even spoken with Jesus personally before this? Or maybe, certainly, she must have been there in the crowd when he was preaching. Somehow she, she heard from him, and she realized she could be forgiven through him. And she trusted him. And now this love that she shows is the sign of that faith. There's no reason why you couldn't do the same. If you're outside of Christ, there's no reason why you couldn't trust him also. There's nothing to stop you putting your faith in him. If this woman, with all her baggage, all her past, all her sordid background, if she could trust Christ and be saved, then so can you. So can you. And the Lord reassure you himself from heaven. And you know your faith has saved you. You know you've got peace with God forever. Then you'll love him then you'll love him. We'll pray together now.